Hello, and welcome to the Chapter 4 lecture for Crowley's An Introduction to Human Disease. This chapter is all about congenital and hereditary diseases. So I want to stress initially, um, before we start this discussion, the difference between uh, genotype and phenotype. So your genotype is not your destiny. Genotype does not equal phenotype. Remember, our genes are transcribed and translated into proteins, and those are what give us our traits or diseases. Also, remember that genes can be turned on or turned off, we call that gene regulation, by different environmental factors or conditions. And the study of how the environment and uh, sort of interacts with our genes to turn them on and off is called epigenetics. So when cells are exposed to chemicals, whether they are vitamins or uh, drugs, like pharmaceutical drugs or hormones produced by the body, um, it can alter our gene expression, so which proteins are made. And then, in turn, that alters our phenotype. So uh, the environment doesn't change the sequence of our genes, okay? It doesn't change the letters, but it can change the sort of coiling pattern or folding pattern of the DNA to make certain genes easier or harder to get to. So that's how the environment can turn genes on or off and how the environment can interact with our genes in order to influence our phenotype. So just because you have the gene for something doesn't mean you have that something because that something, that trait, might not actually be expressed or turned on based on the environment. So an interesting thing about epigenetics is that our DNA actually gets imprinted in the uterine environment. So when parents pass on their DNA sequence to their offspring, the fetus is inheriting the DNA from the parents, but they're also inheriting epigenetic modifications or sort of different types of folding modifications as well because of the environment of the uterus. So exposure to different chemicals or lack of certain nutrients, all those things can disrupt gene expression and embryonic development that leads to some congenital or hereditary conditions. Um, another thing that's interesting about epigenetic imprinting is that um, the mother here is generation one, and the fetus, developing fetus here, is generation two. So the mother's the mother's pregnancy and the different chemicals that she's exposed to during pregnancy will affect her fetus, but it also affects the germ cells of the developing fetus, which are gonna give rise to the next generation. So the sort of uh, moral here is that your epigenetics are influenced both by your mother's pregnancy and by your grandmother's pregnancy. So that's kind of crazy to think about. All right, um, Diving into the content of the chapter, the first thing I want to clarify is some terminology. So the terms congenital, heritable, and genetic overlap a lot, but they are not synonyms. So congenital means present at birth. Heritable means it was inherited from your parents. And genetic means that it is encoded in the DNA, that it's in your DNA. Okay, so I made this sort of flow chart to kind of explain the differences. So a congenital disease is any disease that you are born with. Most congenital diseases are inherited. They are heritable and they are inherited from the parents, but not always. Some congenital conditions are acquired at birth. So a healthy fetus undergoes uh, some trauma during labor. Um, where they're under distress, maybe don't get enough oxygen to the brain. So for example, cere cerebral palsy, CP, is a condition that's caused by labor trauma, by lack of oxygen to the brain during labor. 
Um, the book does not go into those types of congenital conditions, so that's all I'll talk about those. So and under heritable conditions, most heritable conditions are going to be genetic because you inherit your genes, your DNA from your parents. Um, but our parents specifically are, you know, womb bearing parents um, also uh, pass on their environment and environmental exposures. So there are heritable conditions that are due to the environment uh, the fetus develops in. Lastly, um, when it comes to genetic conditions, uh, most of these uh, conditions that involve genes are heritable. They came from our parents, but sometimes they come from spontaneous mutations that arise during embryonic development. So it wasn't something, it wasn't a mutation that your parents have. Um, it's one that you have because it spontaneously arose while you were in development. So most, uh, actually about half of congenital conditions uh, fall into the, one of these four categories. The other half are considered idiopathic. A lot of congenital conditions we don't understand. We don't know how they develop. And a lot of that is because embryogenesis uh, happens in the womb, which is not an environment where scientists can really study that process. So a lot of it's kind of, you know, in the dark. Um, but about 50% of congenital diseases are due to either intrauterine injury or one of these genetic um, anomalies. So let's start with conditions that are due to intrauterine fetal injury. So the ones that are environmental, I go back to this slide here, all right, that are um, heritable, but due to environmental sort of causes, exposure to different chemicals or substances. So the first chemical we'll talk about is alcohol. Um, excessive alcohol consumption is known to increase the risk of miscarriage and or lead to fetal alcohol spectrum disorders, the most severe being fetal alcohol syndrome. So alcohol binds to receptors in the brain, which then disrupts normal brain development of the fetus and contributes to these various levels of intellectual disability. Uh, I do want to note that the textbook uses the phrase mental retardation, which is not considered, it's outdated and honestly considered offensive. So please don't use it. Um, I will continue to use the term intellectual disability and encourage you to do the same. So the amount of alcohol that's required to cause these conditions is not known, which is why doctors really just give a blanket recommendation that females abstain from alcohol during pregnancy, because it's not known how much alcohol is necessary to uh, give rise to these conditions. And it's probably different, different women, different metabolisms, different body weights, different genetics all probably contribute. So there's no safe amount. Um, another thing that can damage developing embryos is radiation. So pregnant women have to avoid radiation because uh, radiation damages DNA. It actually breaks DNA, which is a problem even in adults that are exposed to radiation, but it's um, not such a big problem because most cells in adult bodies are resting. They're not actively dividing and they have time to sort of fix the broken DNA. But in a developing embryo, the cells are constantly dividing and they don't have time to fix broken DNA. Broken DNA just messes up the cell division and results in abnormal daughter cells that then cannot continue to develop. So it's particularly dangerous for developing fetuses and also for germ cells, for egg and sperm producing cells. Um, to be exposed, which is why if you are getting an x-ray and you're not pregnant, they will still put a lead blanket or vest over your genitals, over your gonads to protect your egg and sperm from potential damage. Um, so 
pregnant women are some, sometimes there is a need to x-ray a pregnant woman, but it would have to be a pretty severe need. Um, the cost-benefit analysis would have to be there. Um, drugs and pharmaceuticals can also affect fetal development. The most famous example of this was the thalidomide disaster in the 1950s. So thalidomide was a new drug that was approved to treat nausea and vomiting. So in Europe, it was commonly prescribed to help ease the suffering of women with morning sickness, so pregnant women. Um, and then a few months later, you know, nine months to a year later, it uh, doctors realized that a lot of babies were being born with abnormal limbs, either um, stunted arms or stunted legs or both. And it's a condition that's called phocomelia. And it turned out that the thalidomide was causing it, that thalidomide actually like uh, interfered with angiogenesis or um, blood vessel formation in the limbs early in development. And so then the limbs didn't develop fully. Um, all of these things, thalidomide, uh, other drugs, alcohol, any type of chemical that can cause birth defects is called a teratogen. That's a vocabulary term, again, that's left out of the textbook, but it's important to know. A teratogen is any chemical that can cause a birth defect. So anything on this slide is really a teratogen. Um, just to finish that story about thalidomide, by the way, it was, uh, not given in the US. The director of the FDA at the time did not trust what, whether it was safe to use during pregnancy and did not, it was not prescribed in the US. Um, but it is, was commonly prescribed in parts of Europe, especially England and Germany. So um, a lot of, uh, there's a large thalidomide baby population there. They're now thalidomide adults um, or they're adults with phocomelia. Um, and that whole ordeal resulted in very strict regulations of drugs during pregnancy. So there's now um, very, there's now classifications of drugs that are approved and safe to take during pregnancy and those that are definitely not and those that are kind of unknown. So um, I can attest that being pregnant and getting a cold was just the worst because I couldn't take any of my stable cold medications because they're not approved, like NyQuil. So um, you're really limited in pregnancy, which drugs are considered safe because of what happened with thalidomide in the 1950s. We were much more cautious. Um, another thing that the textbook doesn't cover that I think is important to mention is nutritional causes, nutritional um, causes of congenital conditions. So do make a special note of these because this is extra. So the congenital disorders that can be caused by a mother's diet um, are largely the three that I wanna focus on are ones due to folate and iodine deficiency and ones due to mercury toxicity. So um, folate and iodine are both really important for brain and spinal development. And folate deficiency can lead to various neural tube defects. And there are several, but the two most common ones are anencephaly, which literally is a word that means without a brain. So it's a very small, the brain is very underdeveloped and so is the skull. Um, usually cases of anencephaly are non-viable and they are miscarried or stillborn, um, or they only live for a very short time after birth. And the other common neural tube defect is spina bifida. So spina bifida is a herniation, it's a hernia of the spinal cord where it's basically poking out of the skin and of, of the spinal column and has to be surgically tucked back in. And so it can be, in a lot of cases, uh, this, this bulge can be seen and detected on ultrasound. And so usually babies that have this will be delivered via cesarean section because it's um, more gentle and less risk of rupturing this hernia. Um, and then surgery can be done to tuck it back in. However, you can't do it perfectly without harming it. it usually the spinal cord does sustain some injury and uh, babies with spina bifida who 
who survive the birth and surgery um, oftentimes have lower body paralysis or weakness, partial paralysis, partial weakness. Um, so with folate, folate is found mostly in whole grains and green leafy vegetables, which were, you know, pretty common in our diet for centuries. But in the early 1900s, white flour became a thing. We learned how to process. We had you know, technological advances that allowed us to overly process grains and make very light, white, fluffy flour that was actually very low in nutrients, including almost uh, absent in folate. So folate was... So folate deficiency started to become more common in the 1900s and more and more babies were being born with neural tube defects. And so this connection between folate deficiency and neural tube defects was identified in the 1960s. And um, folate supplementation started to be recommended to pregnant women. And then in 1998, um, the U.S. government actually mandated that all white flour be supplemented, like have folate added back to it. So um, like pretty much all the food in the U.S. contains <laughs> added folate in order to reduce the rates of folate deficiency in the population. Um, still, pregnant women are told to take folate supplements to make sure they have plenty of folate for healthy neural tube development. Iodine is found in the soil and foods that are grown in iodine rich soil absorb that iodine. So any food, grain, vegetable, produce, whatever, that's grown in iodine rich soil will give you enough iodine for your needs. It's, a, it's uh, needed in very small quantities. But in parts of the world and parts of the US where the soil, the crop soil is very low in iodine, all of the produce and grains and stuff that grow there are low in iodine and then the people who eat them um, suffer from iodine deficiencies. In the US, the Midwest region is very low in iodine. And so historically that was an area where cretinism which is an intellectual dis a congenital intellectual disability due to iodine deficiency during pregnancy um, was more common. Again, once this was recognized, the government started mandating supplementation of, in this case, it was salt. We add iodine to our salt. So when you go to the store, you buy a thing of salt, it usually says iodized salt. Um, because it was an easy way to make sure everyone in the population was getting the minimal amount of iodine that they need to prevent iodine deficiency and cretinism. So these are deficiency conditions, congenital conditions caused by nutrient deficiencies during pregnancy, but there is also an important um, toxic chemical that we want to avoid when we're pregnant, and that is mercury, specifically a form of mercury called methyl mercury. So this is not silver, the silver liquidy stuff that you think of in thermometers. This is a different an organic form. Um, and this happens when mercury, so mercury is released into the atmosphere by volcanoes, um, by industry, and then it kind of rains down into the water, uh, into aquatic environments where it bioaccumulates in living creatures. So it accumulates in the plankton that grow in that water or the, the, the plants that grow in the water and then the little uh, microbes and small fish that eat those plants um, and incorporate it into their tissues and then bigger fish eat them and bigger fish eat them and so on and so forth. So each time we move up the food chain, there's more and more methylmercury. So, the types of fish that contain high amounts of mercury are usually large fish like tuna, albacore tuna, and swordfish. And so pregnant women just have to moderate their intake. They don't have to avoid it entirely. Small amounts of very, very tiny amounts of mercury are okay, um, but you don't want to get too much because the mercury is a neurotoxin. It 
localizes to the brain and it preferentially localizes to the fetal brain and it disrupts brain development, which can lead to miscarriage or to severe brain anomalies in the newborn. Um, so there's that. Make sure if you're pregnant that you're getting plenty of folate and that you're getting sufficient amounts of iodine. Again, these deficiencies are really uncommon now in the U.S. and other developed countries where the foods are supplemented. Um, and then with mercury, just watching your fish intake and sticking to low mercury fish. Okay, another environmental agent besides drugs and alcohol and nutrients that can harm a developing fetus are pathogens. Many infections can lead to congenital disability or disorders. And a lot of a common theme is that a lot of these um, infections cause really pretty mild disease in the mother, but can cause really devastating symptoms um, or damage to the developing embryo that either lead to miscarriage or congenital diseases. So let's start with listeria because we were just talking about dietary considerations during pregnancy. And this is a bacteria that is foodborne, meaning you get it from eating contaminated food, usually soft cheeses, unpasteurized dairy, undercooked meat, um, and now even produce is a problem. So listeria is unique um, amongst bacteria because it can actually cross the placenta and infect the fetus. Most bacterial infections just stay in the mo mother's body. It doesn't have the ability to cross the placenta, but listeria does. And so it will attack the fetus. Um, and either kill it or it could be born with meningitis, inflammation of the brain or um, brain damage or uh, disrupt the development of the brain. Toxoplasma, in fact, a lot of these do affect the brain of the developing fetus. Toxoplasma is a common um, protozoan infection or parasite that occurs in cats. And so having pet cats is a risk factor for developing toxoplasma during pregnancy. Now, if you've had a cat for a long time um, and then you become pregnant, you're probably less likely to get the toxoplasma because you might have you might already have it. And um, that's less of an issue than if you get infected while you are pregnant. Anyway, one common recommendation for pregnant women is don't handle cat litter. Don't change the cat litter. Don't scoop the cat poop because the toxoplasma is shed in the cat poop and that is how you get infected. Um, rubella. Rubella was probably historically the most common cause uh, infectious agent that caused birth defects. Um, Rubella is a very mild rash disease. If you get it, whether you're a child or an adult, it's real mild and you probably don't even know that you had it. But if a pregnant woman gets it, it has a very high rate of causing miscarriage or like severe systemic multiple organ systems um, disrupted by uh, in the fetus, in the newborn. So the good news is that there is a vaccine to prevent rubella. And it's the R in the MMR vaccine. The R in the MMR vaccine stands for rubella. And something like 97% of people or something have the MMR vaccine. So we have really reduced the occurrence of rubella in the population. Um, and so now congenital rubella is super, super rare, but it used to be really the number one cause of congenital malformations. Um, so get your MMR vaccine, uh, especially if you're female and of childbearing age. Next on the list here is HIV, human immunodeficiency virus. This is the virus that causes AIDS. And unlike all the other pathogens on this list, HIV really is not very good at crossing the placenta. Um, 
the reason why this list is relatively small is because most infectious agents don't cross the placenta. So if mom gets sick, it's just mom that's sick. But the thing that makes a lot of these unique is that they can cross the placenta. HIV, not so much. So you can be pregnant and not pass HIV on to your child. HIV is in the blood. It infects white blood cells. Um, but the those cells, those white blood cells don't cross the placenta. Only small things, like whatever. Neither of the red blood cells actually cross the placenta. Um, they do, though, during labor, because in labor, there's a lot of ripping away of the placenta and lots of bleeding, um, lots of blood mixing during labor. And so in order to prevent HIV transmission to the offspring, um, cesareans are recommended. So usually a cesarean can successfully deliver a baby that is HIV negative. Also breastfeeding, the um, there are white blood cells in breast milk and so HIV can be transmitted through breast milk. So you can prevent HIV transmission from mother to fetus simply by doing C-sections and bottle feeding. Next we have CMV, cytomegalovirus is what it's called. It's a super common virus, uh, something like half or a little bit more than half of adults in the U.S. have already been infected at some point in their life. Again, causes mild illness, like cold-like symptoms, fatigue, um, occasionally causes more severe symptoms, like a mono kind of, a mononucleosis. Um, the problem, the real danger is if you are infected though while you are pregnant, because it can, again, it somehow infects the brain or dam causes damage to areas of the brain particularly those in um, the temporal lobe where the hearing cortex is. So uh, a common result of CMV infection is hearing loss. Sometimes also it can do more damage, lead to intellectual disability or microcephaly. Um, but the number one cause of congenital hearing loss is CMV, cytomegalovirus infection. And then lastly, we have Zika virus, which is a relatively newly emerged virus. It is transmitted by mosquitoes. And these are mosquitoes that live in very tropical regions. So like South America, Africa, and Southeast Asia um, are where those, those mosquitoes are found and therefore where Zika virus is found. So you're relatively safe up here in the Adirondacks from contracting the Zika virus unless you travel. Um, but Zika virus has uh, made the news for sure because um, there's a high prevalence of microcephaly, which is small brain is what it means. That's really an underdeveloped brain and skull that um, can happen in uh, fetuses of Zika infected mothers. All right, so those were all, believe it or not, we just finished talking about all of these different types of intrauterine injuries. So different environmental factors that can lead to congenital disorders. Now we're gonna to switch to talking about various genetic conditions. So um, the most complex type of genetic condition is one that involves multiple genes and also environmental factors. So these are conditions that we know have a genetic basis because they run in families. Um, you're more likely to have a, a higher prevalence if it runs, you know, if there's other cases in your family. But there's no one gene and they don't follow any kind of specific pattern of inheritance because there's multiple factors involved, some genetic, some environmental. So some common congenital disorders though that fall into this category are cleft lip and or cleft palate. So it's where the palatine bone um, on the roof of your mouth doesn't form properly. It's actually two bones that fuse together. 
And if that fusion process doesn't happen, then you're left with this like gully, a rift in the upper palate or in the front of that bone um, in the lip or both. So you can have cleft palate, cleft lip, or cleft palate and cleft lip. Um, and that can be surgically repaired, but it does interfere with feeding, especially as a newborn. Um, Neural tube defects, like we saw previously with so folate deficiency is not the only cause or it's one contributing factor, but there's also genetic factors that play a role. And then there's a variety of different congenital heart diseases. So uh, when the newborn um, in, in utero, you aren't breathing with your lungs. You are getting oxygen from the placenta through the umbilical cord. And so the heart is made um, in such a way that air, that blood is oxygenated in the lungs, it flows from the lungs to one heart chamber, then goes to another heart chamber, then out to the body, and so on and so forth. So in a fetal heart, um, the oxygenation is happening differently, and so the blood doesn't need to flow in that same pattern. And so there's actually extra holes in the fetal heart that when the baby is born, they naturally close up. So that blood can flow in one direction, lungs to body, and so on and so forth. Um, but in a lot of congenital heart diseases, the, the holes do not close properly. So this one is um, a hole between the top two chambers, and this is a picture of a hole between the bottom two chambers that, uh, in the septum that doesn't close up. Um, single gene disorders, though, those are due to mutations in the DNA. Well, pretty much all genetic disorders, all genetic disorders, whether they're complex or single gene, involve gene mutations. Um, so a gene mutation, there's many types of mutations. It's a change in the sequence of the DNA, All right. So epigenetics is we change which genes are turned on and off by folding the DNA or twisting it differently or doing some other stuff to it. But mutations are changes in the actual sequence, the actual code. So you can have a substitution where um, the bases are changed, like from a C to an A. You can have deletion where a base is actually removed. And you could have additions where the base, bases are added. And these lead to um, mutations in the code that result in either an abnormal protein being formed or no protein being formed, depending on what the mutation is. And so without that normal protein function, the body doesn't function properly. Um, so single gene mutations uh, follow classic patterns of inheritance, you know, dominant, recessive. So some mutant alleles are dominant and follow a dominant pattern of inheritance, meaning there's a 50-50 chance of passing the trait on to your offspring. Uh, an example of a dominant single gene mutation that causes congenital condition is achondroplasia. So achondroplasia is a single gene mutation. It's a mutation in a gene called FGFR3 that makes a protein that's involved in the development of bones. And the mutant protein doesn't, leads to improper development of bones, which leads to the short stature, particularly short limbs. Um, achondroplasia is the most common form of dwarfism. And the picture I have here is actually of a, a celebrity family, the Roloffs. They have a TV show, reality TV show. Um, called Little People Big World, and the two parents um, here in the middle, I can't even tell if my cursor's working, ah, there, oops, <laughs> the dad and the mom here both have achondroplasia. They have four kids. One of them has achondroplasia, and three of them are um, norm, have the normal gen genotype and are normal height. So even though both of the parents, so it means that both of the parents are heterozygous. They have one copy of the dominant achondroplasia gene and one copy of the recessive normal gene. 
And some of their kids got two recessive genes and some of their kids got one or two um, achondroplasia genes. Uh, in terms of recessive uh, diseases, diseases that are, are only present when you have two copies of the recessive gene, um, some are listed here. So the first one I'm going to talk about is phenylketonuria, or PKU for short. So PKU um, is due to a mutant gene of the phenylalanine hydroxylase enzyme, which is responsible for breaking down phenylalanine. So phenylalanine is an amino acid, and it's found it's a it's a building block of proteins. So it it's found in foods that are high in protein. And normally the phenylalanine, the an, a normal uh, genotype is someone who has this PAH enzyme, which breaks down the phenylalanine into various byproducts that are then excreted in the urine and everything's fine. Um, in somebody with PKU, they lack that enzyme or they have a, a mutated, unaffected version of that enzyme. And so the phenylalanine doesn't get broken down and it doesn't get excreted and it builds up in the body and it tends to kind of uh, accumulate in nervous tissue in the brain and can cause brain damage very quickly in within the first year of life. If a, if a baby is not diagnosed and they continue to drink milk, and that's high in protein, um, they, they will suffer severe brain damage. So this is a disease that's usually test, tested for at birth. Um, and if a baby has PKU, the good news is that the treatment for it is just a low protein diet that by reducing the amount of phenylalanine that you consume, you reduce the toxic buildup and can live a perfectly healthy life. It also means that certain foods that contain a lot of phenylalanine have to have warning labels. And one of those types of foods is uh, aspartame. Aspartame is an artificial sweetener that's found in a lot of diet sodas. And so if you look at the nutrition label for diet sodas, it'll say, warning, fetal ketonurics contains phenylalanine. Um, still talking about some recessive diseases. Another one that I want to highlight is cystic fibrosis. So cystic fibrosis, often just referred to as CF, is another example of a recessive genetic disease. So you have to have two copies of this mutant CFTR gene in order to have the disease. Otherwise, you are just a carrier. Um, so this protein or this gene, the CFTR gene makes a protein that's a channel protein and it's responsible for the flow of ions, of chloride ions out of the cell. Um, in cells that line the respiratory tract, the gastrointestinal tract, all the cells in the body that make mucus essentially. And so when chloride flows out of the cell, um, ions attract water, right? So water basically flows with it, and that makes the mucus very watery and very runny, which is good because then it moves, flows out of the respiratory tract or out of the gastrointestinal tract. So we want mucus to be sticky enough to trap dirt and bacteria and stuff, but watery enough to actually be able to flow out and get rid of it. In cystic fibrosis, this channel is not functional. The mutated channel does not allow for flow of ions out of the cell. And so the mucus doesn't fill with all these ions. And then also the water doesn't go into the mucus. So remember what with osmosis, water follows solute. The solute, these ions are not flowing. So the water is not flowing. And so the mucus is very thick and kind of dry and sticky and it doesn't move very well and it can kind of accumulate especially in the airways so this would be a normal airway where the watery mucus can clear just fine and this is a cf airway where there's just a lot of mucus and you can see very little airflow so the main danger with cf is lung infections and um, just mucus buildup that 
results in not being able to breathe. So people with CF do often have shortened lifespans. They tend to succumb in early or middle adulthood from lung infections or just um, mucus buildup. There are, however, gene therapies that are in the works to treat people with CF and give them um, basically fix their mutant gene so that they can produce the ion flow and uh, more watery mucus. There's also situations that um, both alleles are dominant, that we say that they are co-dominant, that there's not a dominant and recessive allele, but there's two dominant alleles. And that results in co-dominance. And a classic example of co-dominance in genetic diseases is sickle cell anemia. So red blood cells are normally round, sort of donut-shaped cells. They're full of protein called hemoglobin, which is the protein in blood that carries oxygen. In sickle cell, a mutation in the hemoglobin gene results in a mutant hemoglobin protein that causes the cell to form a different shape. We call it a sickled shape. It looks like a sickle, which is like a tool for like cutting wheat. All right, you can also say it's crescent shaped. Um, and the problem with this is that our blood vessels, our capillaries are very, very small and really only large enough for one blood cell to move through at a time. And these little donut shaped cells can do that quite nicely. But the sickled shells, they're the sickled cells are elongated and have a tendency to get stuck. They can't fit through the blood vessel and they get stuck and they form blockages and then blood can't get through and then oxygen can't get through to those tissues. Um, also the mutant hemoglobin doesn't bind oxygen as well. So for lots of reasons, it, this disease results in anemia, a lack of red blood cells and oxygen. Um, the blockages can lead to um, lack of blood flow to peripheral regions. It can cause peripheral nerve damage and it can lead to strokes and heart attacks, which is often how people die. But these blockages can also be very painful. So people living with sickle cell anemia often um, struggle from these bouts of extreme pain from these blockages. So if you have two, if you're homozygous for the normal um, red blood cells, right? If your genotype is homozygous for the normal allele, then you will have all normal red blood cells and you'll be very healthy. If you have, if you're homozygous, you have two copies of the sickled allele, then you will have sickle cell anemia and pretty much all of your red blood cells will be malformed. But if you have one of each, if you have one allele for the normal red blood cells and one allele for the sickled red blood cells, you'll have a mixture of the two. But you'll have more of the normal red blood cells and a handful of those sickled red blood cells. So not enough sickled cells to usually make you sick or give you anemia or even give you any of these blockages. So people who um, uh, are heterozygous are generally healthy even though they have the presence of some of these sickled red blood cells. They also gain a bit of a superpower, which is that they are fairly resistant to malaria. Malaria is a protozoan, a parasite that infects red blood cells, and but it doesn't infect the sickled red blood cells. And so people with sickled cell anemia and those that have some, even some sickled cells show um, resistance to malaria infection. So you find that these genes for sickled, for sickle cell anemia, for sickled hemoglobin, um, are much more common in populations in areas where malaria is endemic or if you have ancestry from those areas. So people with ancestry from Africa and from the Middle East, actually, um, where malaria is common, have are more likely to have the gene for sickle cell anemia. All right, so those were various diseases that were caused by a single gene, um, a single gene. And now we're gonna talk about uh, genetic diseases that involve 
a whole chromosome or a piece of a chromosome, which is several genes, right? But they're all on the same piece of DNA. So they're different than the multi-gene complex diseases like cleft palate, because that probably involves a lot of genes in a lot of places. Okay, but this we're talking about a lot of genes on one chunk of DNA. So the the chromosomal disorders, um, they're pretty much always due to gametes, either sperm or egg, that basically effed up during meiosis when they were being formed during gametogenesis. So the two main types of meiosis malfunctions are non-disjunction and translocation. So non-disjunction, whoopsie, um, happens when homologous chromosomes, so when they're supposed to be separating from each other into two separate cells, two daughter cells, um, when one of them does not separate and it stays with its partner and um, and so the chromosomes don't get divided in evenly between the two daughter cells. Meiosis has two divisions. Remember first they divide um, and then they divide again in order to make haploid cells. So non-disjunction can happen in the first division or in the second division. So there's two points during meiosis in which this can happen. And the result is um, a bunch of, of gametes, if you will, that are not haploid. They don't contain one set of two chromosomes. In this case, uh, these guys are supposed to have, have two chromosomes, okay? So in this case, when there was non-disjunction in meiosis one, we end up with two gametes that have three chromosomes and two that have one chromosome. So none of them have the correct number of two. They all have odd numbers of chromosomes. None of these are going to result in functional uh, fertilization. And then in this scenario over here, um, two of the gametes turned out okay, um, the ones that came from this cell, but these two came out odd. And so this is why a lot of times pregnancy doesn't happen on the first try, because sometimes our gametes are just not made well. All right, non-disjunction um, results in these odd numbers of chromosomes, which is called aneuploidy, and I'll show you that word on the next slide. Aneuploidy is usually unviable, so it might result in fertilization, but the embryo won't develop for very long, so it can result in miscarriage. Common cause of miscarriage is meiosis, issues with meiosis, leading to defective um, gametes, eggs, or sperm. The other type of chromosomal anomaly is tra called translocation, and translocation happens when two different chromosomes swap pieces. So in meiosis, it is normal for homologous chromosomes, for homologous chromosomes to swap pieces. So like these two red chromosomes might swap pieces or these two gray chromosomes might swap pieces with each other. That's normal in meiosis. That's the crossing over event that happens in meiosis that leads to some mixing and matching between the mother, uh, between the chromosome from mom and the chromosome from dad. But in translocation, two different chromosomes swap pieces. And that's not cool. That's not supposed to happen, okay? And what the result of this is, you could have an embryo, so if these, these are the various different gametes that could form from these two parents and the various different combinations. So we could have a combination where they uh, get normal chromosomes from each parent and we have a normal uh, genotype here. Um, we could get what's called a balanced translocation where they do get these translocated, these flip-flopped uh, pieces of DNA, but it's still balanced because they still have two red tips and they still have two gray tips. So they still have the same total 
amount of genes and amount of DNA. It's just they're just kind of like swapped, switched places. But in these scenarios, these are what we call unbalanced translocations. So if you look at this third embryo here, um, it has two full red chromosomes, but it also has an extra piece of the red chromosome attached to this gray one here. And so in a way, it is, it's partially aneuploid. It doesn't have an entire third extra red chromosome, but it does have a part of it. And sometimes that's enough to make things uneven and uh, mess with cell development. So um, aneuploidy, most types of aneuploidy, whether they come from non-disjunction or they come from translocation, most of them, an aneuploidy is having an abnormal number of chromosomes, either whole chromosomes or even you can have partial aneuploidy. Um, and most of these conditions are non-viable, meaning that either they don't re even result in successful fertilization or they result in successful fertilization, but then um, natural abortion or miscarriage. Um, but there are a handful of aneuploid conditions that are viable. And the they are listed here. So trisomy 13 and trisomy 18 um, result in conditions that are characterized by um, intellectual disabilities. These are more severe conditions and most of the time they are not viable. The, the viable scenarios are in the minority. So um, most likely if you are pregnant with a fetus that has trisomy 13, meaning as three copies of chromosome 13, you're most likely to miscarry or have a stillbirth. The exception is trisomy 21. And this is probably because if we look at this karyotype here, the collection of all of the chromosomes, chromosome 21 is really small. So having an extra one is still a small amount of extra DNA. So that's sort of my hypothesis of why trisomy 21 is kind of the exception, where most cases of trisomy 21 are viable. Um, they do have a higher rate of miscarriage for sure compared to normal karyotypes, um, but most of the time uh, they are fine. I don't know. I don't know the right word. I don't want to say healthy, um, but they are uh, definitely survive and thrive. So um, try, if I just want to look at number 13 and number 18, these are larger chromosomes. So that's why I guess these are more deleterious, if you will. So in this karyotype, you can see all of the chromosome pairs. There's two of every single number of chromosomes, except for number 21. Here, there are three of them. Trisomy 21 is the genetic, biological, medical, official term. Um, Down syndrome is the uh, is the name that is uh, used because the a doctor named something Down. His last name was Down. Uh, first kind of described and identified this condition. So um, individuals with Down syndrome who have trisomy 21 have characteristic facial features and usually shorter stature, um, and they are more prone to cardiac and gastrointestinal anomalies, and they have some intellectual disabilities. Um, they also are stereotypically very happy and joyful individuals. So there's also aneuploidy of the sex chromosomes. So you can have an extra X or an extra Y, or in the case of XO, have um, only one X. All right, so these syndromes um, vary. So triple X and XYY, triple X individuals are... Uh, have female sexual characteristics and XYY males have male character, sexual characteristics. These two conditions really don't, they really don't result in any symptoms, detectable symptoms. Um, these are usually diagnosed sort of accidentally if somebody needs a karyotype for something. 
there is a slightly increased risk of learning disabilities that they've found in studies, but I would not call these like diseases. They're just atypical um, genotypes, atypical karyotypes. These two conditions, though, if you have uh, if you have XXY, these individuals have male sexual characteristics, but they don't. They they also develop some female body patterns, so female fat distribution, including the breast tissue, which is called gynecomastia, and their testes are um, very small and underdeveloped, and um, don't produce sperm or produce very few sperm. And Turner syndrome, so it's called Klinefelter syndrome, and then females who only have one X um, have something called Turner syndrome, which results in a shorter stature. There's also some heart defects involved, and the ovaries don't develop properly. So these two genotypes, these two aneuploidy conditions of the sex chromosomes, they do have some um, phenotypic uh, symptoms and signs. They also um, affect the reproductive cells and make people infertile, and unable to produce functional gametes. Another disease that affects the, another chromosomal condition that affects the sex chromosome, specifically the X chromosome, is a condition called fragile X. And it's called that because the X chromosome has this sort of weak, narrowed area, this region here. So this is a normal X chromosome on the left and a fragile X on the right. This is a condition that's more common in males. Pretty much any condition that falls on the X chromosome is more likely to be expressed in males because females could have a double X phenotype where they have one normal X and one fragile X. Fragile X is an intellectual disability. There's also some other phenotypic um, signs like large testes, uh, certain facial characteristics, long face, and it's more common in boys. So diagnosis of all of these congenital conditions can happen through multiple techniques. Some of them can be detected on ultrasound. Usually in the second or third trimester, you can start seeing things like you could see spina, but you could see a spinal hernia. You could see um, microcephaly. The head measurements are not reading out correctly. So some of them that cause um, achondroplasia, so uh, poor development of the bones, shortened limbs, um, those would be de detectable a lot of times in ultrasound. But some of these conditions are not detectable in via ultrasound and so we need to actually sample the cells and, and sample the DNA um, of the fetus. So we used to do this primarily through going into the uterus with a needle and taking a sample of cells either from the amniotic fluid or from the chorion around like where the placenta is developing. Um, and these are invasive procedures involve sticking a needle into the uterus which can cause infection or rupture. Um, so there, there is a sort of higher risk with doing these procedures. There's some risk for sure with any procedure, but there's really very little risk with ultrasound that's non-invasive. It's just right using sound waves to see things. Um, these procedures are less common now because of advances in technology that allow us to actually test fetal DNA that's flowing in the mother's bloodstream. So it turns out that there, although um, the fetus and the uh, mother don't really exchange cellular components across the placenta, they do um, exchange DNA. And so fetal DNA can be detected in the maternal blood. And so that's how um, a lot of these blood genetic tests are done, just using blood from the mother. Um, there are false positives and false negatives though. So it's uh, usually optional. Mothers are given the option of doing these genetic tests because it can give them information to decide what they want to do about continuing their pregnancy or about um, potential you know, um, accommodations during labor, during pregnancy to ensure the best outcomes for 
children with genetic disabilities. Um, some of these conditions, though, won't be tested for until the baby is born. And in most states, it is required for babies to undergo genetic testing through a blood test that they get a little heel prick right when they're born. They do a little poke in the heel and um, send that off for genetic tests, send these blood, blood spots off for genetic testing to look for things like PKU, phenylketonuria, or cystic fibrosis. Okay, neither of those have any outward signs of, um, of disease. They're metabolic. They're all at the cellular level. But um, treatment and uh, precautions need to be taken sort of right away. So it's important to know that at birth. And that is the end of chapter four.